you probably read the title of this video and thought, what the hell are you on about? And that's fair enough, but bear with me. Red Bull dominated in Bahrain and no one is expecting anything different in Saudi Arabia. There is a lot of season left yet, and things aren't looking good for them as the season goes on. In the garage, things aren't looking good either as the team are on the cusp of losing one of their greatest assets. Stick around to find out why this season isn't over quite yet. On track, Red Bull have started as strongly as any team in F1 history. They are comfortably a second a lap faster on race pace, and in qualifying, Max Verstappen is pretty much unbeatable. Last year, they were dominant. This year, they're a level above that, but it might not last. The team lost their passionate owner, Dietrich Mateschitz, last autumn. There didn't seem to be an effect on the team at the time, but now the consequences of his passing are starting to be felt in the team. Mateschitz was the man who bought the Jaguar F1 team and installed Christian Horner as team principal and Adrian Newey as technical director. He was the one who set up their B team as well when they purchased Minardi and rebranded it as Scuderia Toro Rosso. But all of this was done with the help of one very important man, Dr. Helmut Marco. Marco is a divisive figure in the F1 paddock. He's never been afraid of causing a controversy or sharing his very strong opinions on other drivers and teams. At times, the things he has said seem completely separate from the message the team are trying to share. That's because he never really reported into the team. His role, that of a lone wolf within the Red Bull team, came directly from his friendship with Mateschitz, who had first approached him as a fan at a hill climb when Marco was still competing. Having idolized Jochen Rint, Mateschitz was drawn to Marco because the latter had been a close friend of Rint, F1's posthumous 1970 champion. Marco didn't report to anyone but Mateschitz, and even then as a close friend rather than an employee. His close friendship with Mateschitz meant he was able to make decisions freely. Marco is definitely an act first, explain later kind of guy, and that worked because his boss trusted him. And Dietrich had plenty of reasons to trust Helmet as well. It was Marco who first put Mateschitz and Horner together after Horner bought the assets of Marco's RSM Marco Formula 3000 team in the late 1990s. He was also instrumental in not only getting Max Verstappen on board, but also promoting him into Red Bull's senior F1 team mid-season. It is Marco who manages the incredible Red Bull Junior team program, which has brought through so many incredible drivers. With Dietrich Mateschitz as his only reporting line, Helmet was free to operate as he saw best. I know he regularly pissed off large portions of the fan base and the paddock, but he's played a significant role in the Red Bull team succeeding in the way they have. The role he has played, separate from the structure of a much larger corporation, is not one that exists in most companies though. He was a very involved advisor to Mateschitz, who trusted Marco completely. Dietrich's successor does not have the same relationship with Helmet though. Mateschitz's old role was effectively split into three, with Oliver Mintzlaff moving up from being chief executive of Red Bull's RB Leipzig Football Club to a chief executive of corporate projects and investments role that encompasses all the firm's media and sporting projects, including the F1 team. Apparently, Mintzlaff doesn't care much for motorsport and has a poor relationship with Red Bull's motorsport advisor Helmut Marko. You can see this relationship straining in some comments made by Helmut Marko on Red Bull Media House's own Speed Week website last week. Why they would publish these comments in their own media outlet is baffling, but here you go. We've met twice, said Marco. He was given some insight. How well he'll respond to our ideas remains to be seen. Red Bull Racing has always been very autonomous. It's no longer the case that I call with a report after every practice and race. The direct, personal, friendly relationship is no longer there. Didi was a visionary, had emotions. I'm not seeing that anymore. I'm a free person, I can stop any time if I'm no longer enjoying it. We'll see how the future goes. Marco is clearly not happy with how his new boss is managing his role and the Red Bull team as a whole. Christian Horner has always had the freedom to run the team how he sees best, and that has brought them great success. Red Bull building their own engines is the final step in that process. The team might be branded as Red Bull, but it is definitely Horner's team. Mintzlaff is likely looking to create a more rigid operating system in the Formula 1 team. Building proper reporting lines and making sure the roles in the team match up with the rest of the brand's sports teams. That leaves Marco in a very awkward spot though, because his role doesn't slot into a standard business model. He could carry on running the academy, but by the sounds of things, 
he won't be able to make the decisions he wants without approval from someone above him. Marco will be 80 this year. He doesn't want to be put into a box after being free for so long. He doesn't need this job. He's earned his money already. He does it for the joy of it now, and by the sounds of things, that joy is fading away due to the new Red Bull corporate structure. The color he brings to the paddock will be missed, but the Red Bulls will miss him the most. Marco's potentially imminent departure will have an effect down the line as Red Bull's conveyor belt of talented drivers comes under new management. But the team have more immediate problems that could derail their championship challenge this season. We've been clear on this channel for weeks already. The teams are going to catch up to Red Bull later in the season. One team in particular seems to be perfectly positioned to do so. The AMR23 is the first car Aston Martin's new dream team of designers has been fully involved with. Ex-Red Bull chief aerodynamicist Dan Fallows is now Aston Martin's technical director. His deputy, Eric Blandin, was previously chief aerodynamicist at Mercedes, helping them to their eight consecutive championship wins. Aston Martin also poached Andrew Alessi from Red Bull in 2021 to become head of technical operations, while engineering director Luca Fabato arrived from Alfa Romeo. Early indications point to the dream team working. Aston Martin has a significant development advantage over Red Bull this year. As part of their penalty for breaching the cost cap for the 2021 season, Red Bull were hit with a further 10% reduction in their wind tunnel time. Red Bull were already set to have less time in the wind tunnel than their rivals due to winning last year's Constructors' Championship. Red Bull were due to only get 70% of their wind tunnel time, an average of 28 runs per week. But with the added penalty, that was reduced to 63%, or 25 runs per week in their wind tunnel. Having finished 7th in the Constructors' Championship last year, Aston Martin get their full wind tunnel allowance, amounting to nearly 60% more than Red Bull. The AMR23 was conceived when Aston Martin had just a 33% increase in development time on Red Bull. If they manage to catch up this much with just 33% more time in the wind tunnel, imagine what they can do with 60%. In terms of Aston's prospects going forward, a good car works everywhere and gives the drivers confidence. Ferrari might well be a bit quicker than Aston and Mercedes over one lap, but when it comes to the longer stints, there's little in it, Sky Sports F1's Martin Brundle said in his latest column. It's already a good package, but if they know where to go to improve it, then by mid-season they could emerge as major challenges to Red Bull. It isn't just the media that are finally taking notice of this development difference between Red Bull and Aston Martin. Helmet Marco is very aware of it as well. Marco said that Red Bull was far from relaxed despite looking comfortable in front right now. We prepared ourselves optimally for the season, he said. Once we knew that this penalty would be imposed, it was clear that when we went into the wind tunnel, it had to be done in an efficient manner and each run with a clear plan. At the moment, we've managed to do all that. But of course, as the season progresses, we run out of wind tunnel time. The others will still have that available and our lead will then melt away. That's why it's extremely important that we take the points with us now. Red Bull might look like favorites for the championship right now, but no F1 season has ever been won in one race, and there's plenty of time for teams to come back. Aston Martin's aim for now has to be to develop as efficiently as possible, until the summer break, when the development sliding scale is recalculated. If Lance and Alonso can pick up enough points to stay within touching distance of Red Bull while the team develops the car, then Red Bull could be in trouble later in the year. Do you think Helmut leaving Red Bull will be a problem for them? And will the development punishment start to hurt the team later in the year? Let us know your opinion in the comments down below. And while you're down there, hit that subscribe button to keep up to date with everything happening in F1. Until next time, drive safe and bye for now.